Good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Sligo Libraries, I'm delighted to offer you a very warm welcome to the launch of The End of the World is a Cul-de-Sac by one of our very favourite authors and a former colleague, Louise Kennedy. Louise is joined tonight by another firm favourite, a uh, friend of the library, poet and author Alice Lyons. Alice is also a regular facilitator of our monthly literary and open mic event, The Word, which we produce in collaboration with IT Sligo. Alice is herself a published author of poetry and fiction and is a lecturer in writing and literature at the Yates Academy of Arts, Design and Architecture in IT Sligo. She has a keen and insightful eye and a warm wit, and I'm delighted that she's here with us this evening to help us delve into the book a little more deeply and to maybe tease out some of Louise's um, process and inspirations for this searingly good collection of short stories. So during the next hour, you can use the chat box to submit comments or questions, and I will read those out to Louise towards the second half of the evening. For the enjoyment of all, please don't forget to keep your mic on mute and I wish you an enjoyable watch. So please let us give a very warm, if silent, welcome from each of our sitting rooms for our esteemed guests, beginning with the wonderful Alice Lyons. Thank you, thank you so much, Lou. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sligo, welcome to virtually to Sligo, and, um, and thank you so much, Lou McGrath and Patricia McKenna and all at Sligo Library Service. Sorry, Patricia Keene at the Sligo Library Service um, for hosting this launch of Louise Kennedy's first book, her <laughs> collection of stories. The end of the world is a cul de sac. So Louise is here with me. Welcome, welcome so, to to this, Louise. Um, the end of the world is a cul de sac is published by Bloomsbury in London. Um, Louise has a lock of awards attached to her writing, which I am going to forego reading to you. Um, tonight, but if you're interested in learning more about Louise, her life, a bit about her background, um, there's a really great portrait of her this last weekend in the, in the Irish Times Saturday weekend supplement by Rosita Boland. Um, or you can listen in to BBC's Front Row last night where Louise uh, did um, an interview, or you can keep your eyes on Twitter where her inimitable wit and self-deprecation are <laughs> in full um, display um, for you to delight in. But but the book, the book is why we're here. And um, I just want to say, I, I'm going to just say a few words about Louise's book and then I'm going to ask her to read from a couple of the stories um, we chatted earlier and talked about a couple of stories um, that she'll read from tonight. But I have to say, I admire this book so much. I love it. I really, really love it. Um, and, and I think what Louise has done here is she's made 15 jewels, like 15 um, the most in, intricate, delicate portraits um, of real people. And these real people are embroiled in real life situations. Um, but they're, the situations are um, as timeless as parables in the Bible. You could find, you know, uh, people in those kinds of situations um, uh, hundreds, thousands of years ago in, in literature, but um, rated R um, in, in this case, and, but also wholly contemporary. Um, of our time. And as I read each story in this book, I just marveled. And, and then I finished. I didn't want it to end. I really, each story was just, it, it, the stories go deep, but they're quick. And then they end and, and you're kind of left bereft. But luckily there's 15 of them. So you have this 15 um, the sequence of 15 to enjoy. But really, as I, when I finished the book, I really went right back to the beginning and just reread and marveled at what Louise was able to do with her writing. There's, there's so much clarity in the stories and there's also concision. There's not any extra word. Um, and there is such insight, fundamental insight into people, um, into us, into how we work, uh, into how we don't work. Um, and to me, it's an instant classic. Um, there's, I, I think to mention, there's just the sheer style of the stories. 
there is not a wasted word. There's, they've all been, all the words have been weighed with a poet's care for language. They've been edited with the sharpest, like most honed editorial tool. Um, and Kennedy uses words for, just like a cook, for their variety and flavor. I just made a couple of notes um, and, and many of you know what a fine cook Louise is. And to me, she has a kind of chef's, like a, like a fine cook's approach to language in, in trying to use the full flavor of language that's available to her. So from Hunter Gatherers, in spite of his heft, there was a lightness in the way he flumped about, just that wonderful word, flumped. There's a lot of words um, that are sort of semi-made up words um, that Louise uses to describe the way that people move about. Another from, she applied makeup and took tongs to her hair, trying to look the way she used to before she became uh, sluggish and through other. Another great word, through other, a Scottish Northern expression that I'd never heard before and I loved it, I underlined it. But it's beyond the, the style, that spare elegant style that Louise has um, naturally in her writing. It's the way she uses it to make these careful incisions in situations and people so that she reveals what's really happening beneath these appearances of surface, of posture, of uh, marriages, friendships, courtships, parents and children, all of these kinds of situations that she's, she's constantly probing beneath. And so uh, there's a story I would love Louise to read a little bit from called Imolk. It's in the, um, in the middle of the book. And I think it appeared first <laughs> in winter paper. Um, and it's the story of Elaine and Liam. Um, and their baby, Grace, and there's another baby on the way. And to all appearances, they are this upstanding rural Irish family during lambing season. But that's all a kind of veneer. Um, and Louise, through her writing, pries off this veneer to show us what's really going on. So Louise, would you read a bit from, from the story? And if there's anything else you wanna say about the story to set it up, please go uh -huh. ahead. Actually, first, I want to thank you so much for that introduction. It's uh, amazing. Actually, thank you, really. I'm very grateful. And uh, and thanks thanks to Louise McGrath as well. Uh, Louise used to be my boss god helper. Um, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, yeah, so I might, um, I'm going to start to read from um, a couple of pages into, into the story. Um, and it's where um, Elaine is really pregnant and she's also lugging a baby around and um, her husband is, it's, it's during the lambing, it's, it's the first day of spring supposedly, but it started to snow and uh, her husband is, um, has been out all night bringing in ewes and he's in the lambing shed with a kind of a, like unhelpfully um, glamorous 19 year old uh, called Stacey Rainey in leopard print wellingtons. Um, so, uh, Elaine is at the kitchen sink watching the comings and goings in the lambing shed and becoming increasingly uh, concerned. So she um, takes a, a trip up the lane in her wellies in the snow uh, to see what's going on. The shed was warm, the air fetid with damp wool and blood and sheep droppings. There were ewes crammed into the big pen, pawing and fretting, heavy bellies skimming the floor. In the small pens, the new mothers were nuzzling and lapping at their newborns. Stacey Rainey was filling a bucket of water at the sink by the wall, dressed in a Letter Letterkenny IT Gaelic football jersey that was a size too small and black wet look jeggings. She put the bucket in one of the pens and came to Elaine. She tickled Grace under the chin and the child's mouth gaped open, a slobbery, happy smile. The wee traitor, thought Elaine. Where's Liam, she said. Stacey inclined her head at the far wall. He's watering. We're afraid the pipes will freeze. We're afraid, thought Elaine, the cheek of her. When are you back to college, said Elaine. Monday week. Great, said Elaine. A panel in the false wall slid aside. For a moment, Elaine glimpsed the rows and rows of plants, the cables and lamps that were strung across the ceiling, their eerie light. Liam banged the panel shut and crossed the floor to her, his feet kicking up, the lime, lime slate straw. Stay in the house, I told you, he said. 
I'm bored. I don't want Grace breathing in this shit. He kissed his daughter on the forehead. What time will you be down for lunch, said Elaine. Half twelve. She put Grace on her other hip. As she passed the big pen, a ewe moaned, a dreadful sound. She called out to Liam to tell him the animal seemed ready, but his back was to her. He was standing with his legs wide apart, talking down to Stacy Rainey, who was crouching on the floor, bottle feeding a lamb through the bars of one of the pens. Her haunches in the leggings were full and shiny. That one's a tramp, Elaine whispered to Grace as they went through the doors of the yard. The clouds were low and pinkish. The gritter hadn't made it, and beyond the lower fields, the road was a lethal grey ribbon. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks, Louise. Louise, where did this, this idea for the story of Liam and Elaine in this lambing shed that's really also got a, a, a growing shed for marijuana behind a false wall, where, does, where did that come from? How did it start? In your mind uh okay so this story started off with a different title and um and, and a different there were sort of problems with it in the beginning so in the beginning i had um i mean some of the some of the pages i think some of the opening pages and definitely um the, the scenes where um elaine is like uh, bathing and getting dressed and dressing grace those probably haven't changed a, a word from the original draft but um uh in the original story um, there wasn't a grow house and there wasn't, uh, Stacy was there all right, but there wasn't a grow house and, um, and Liam was a, was an, a, a good guy, a good guy. I mean, Liam, Liam is still maybe, I still think Liam is maybe a good guy, but he's just in a pretty appalling set of circumstances. Um, but, um, and it had a different title as well. It, I called it Elephant's Breath after that fire on ball paint color. I have no idea why. So there's something about, you know, the, her father turns up and paints a bedroom or whatever. Um, but it really wasn't working. And I think, um, the idea for the grow house maybe came out of um, probably the time I spent in Tubber Curry Library um, uh, sorting the, the local papers because um, the papers would carry <laughs> stories that to me seem to sit really um, kind of uncomfortably together that you might have, um, say, uh, you know, a photograph of elderly people leaving a, a novena in, in a local church um, and underneath it, there'd be a, a story about um, a grow house that had been discovered in, in, in a motor and bungalow up a, a bog road or something with a few guards standing around looking at the roof. Um, I think I saw somewhere that um, apparently a, a roof that's uh, free of snow is a, is a giveaway um, for a grow house because things should be covered with snow. So it's obviously a sign of, of heat or whatever. So I think that probably came in. So that, that story I wrote it and it hadn't worked and I parked it probably for about four years. And, um, and then when I went back and introduced the kind of grow house thing, I was able to finish it in about two days and it worked really quickly. So I think that's sometimes what it is that, you know, I maybe had the setting and the characters, but I didn't have um, a story or enough um, conflict or something really. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you often Before park stories yeah. for a long time? Um, I, yeah, well, I mean, I try not to because um, uh, I, I, it takes me quite a long time to write a story. Uh, it takes me a long time to get in and find, you know, what the, the thread of the story is. So, um, you know, for example, the, the last story, Garland Sunday, I probably worked on that for around 13 or 14 months. I think I wrote maybe 60,000 words. I mean, it wasn't like a linear 60,000 words, but uh, with stops and starts and trying to figure out who, whose story it was, it definitely took me that long. Um, and then um, I think, I mean, mo most of them take a while. Um, uh, sparing the Heather as well. Then when I st I started to try and write the story that, um, that that ended up being Sparing the Heather. And I knew that um, there was a, a body, there was like a, 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 the body of a disappeared, you know, person um, from, from the troubles. Um, but I couldn't figure out how to connect. I, 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 I think, I didn't know how to to um, what 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 story I had to tell to kind to kind of reveal uh, where the body was or or what the what the issue was even. Do you know what I mean? So I had to try and do something mm -hmm. with that. And I, I tried a, um, a vignette in the in the second person uh, that was almost a flashback um, that seemed to be working. At that point, I'd probably written maybe forty thousand words or something. I've been working on it for months. Um, and um, as soon as I put it into the kind of second person in the voice of this teenage girl, it really seemed to be working. So um, so I just kept going with that and tried to keep the tone mm -hmm. steady, even though it ended up, you know, taking place over lots of years. So, so that story became um, in silhouette. Mm -hmm. 
so then the when I went back to yeah, so then when I went back to with you, second person. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but then when I went back to Sparing the Heather uh, again, I was able to to finish it pretty quickly. Um, so I think it's really like I had to write one to figure out what the other was about or something. And like they're very different. So you, you know, formally they're very different. Do you work on a number of stories at the same time, kind of a few pots on the boil? I really try when not to. On um, stories. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, I think that Garland Sunday was like an ongoing thing for a while, and so was Barry and the Heather. So, but at the same time, you know, through that, I probably, you know, finished a, another few stories while I was at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I, I don't know if it's that helpful, really, because you sort of have to, um, I mean, I guess you're trying to get into a character's head or something like that. So I don't know if it's that helpful, mm -hmm. really. Um, it's quite distracting to try and work on a few things at once, but it's it's just kind of how it it turned out and i think there's maybe something as well in um you know the more time that you devote to something the less you feel you can abandon it you know that i just felt because mm -hmm. i'd invested so many months and so many words that um that i had to keep at it to try and figure out what the hell um it was about um you know otherwise mm -hmm. I, i'd kind of wasted a, a year so it was maybe that just to keep trying things and when you're you know kind of working on a story how much are you kind of consciously trying things like, you know, you said there about um, <clears throat> Imolk that when you put the grow house in and there was more conflict or something, that's quite a very conscious thing yeah. to try. And then, and then there's yeah. stuff that happens unconsciously by accident when yeah. you're writing it just kind of, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about both those kind of processes in, in your um, own? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the sort of conscious, um, I mean, I nearly think of the grow house as a repair job or something. Do you know what I mean? The grow house was something mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I had a story. There was a story there. I didn't think it was a very strong story. And I didn't really think I'd got to anything, um, any kind of emotional truth or to anything very interesting. And it was probably a bit, um, maybe a bit uh, predictable in terms of kind of narrative arc or something like that. So, um, I mean, I think that those kind of repairs are done on stories that maybe aren't working, whereas the others, um, I mean, I think they just probably developed organically without me deliberately thinking about it. I mean, I don't plan or anything at all. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, um, all the way through, I don't know what I'm doing. And um, I meaning when I'm finished, I don't know what I'm at. Like, <laughs> but um, there's maybe something about, um, yeah. And I don't know if I really want to know what I'm doing either. Um, I, I, I couldn't sit with the plan. I don't know how people do that. Um, because mm -hmm. if you know what you're going to do and what's going to happen, then I, I don't know where the, the joy would be it, at all. So. So what is the joy for you? Um, I think it's maybe something about, I mean, I think there's maybe something about language or something that I really, um, like mucking around with language and, um, and I think that the, 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 I really enjoy the scene setting and there are other bits of it as well that I really like, I really like writing dialogue, like maybe too much that I sort of have to stop myself because I find it, um, I find it really easy and really good crack. So, um, um, yeah, I have to kind of stop myself from having pages and pages of dialogue. Um, I think as well, I'm not, I don't, I'm not very confident about, um, about, you know, revealing a character's inner voice. I think some writers are brilliant at that. Um, and I have to rely mm -hmm. on other things to try and show, um, show things like that. So, I mean, I think that's where maybe I rely on, on landscape or sort of interiors as well. Um, you know, to try and show the constraints that those are putting on people and just to, uh, to show people how, how they are in their, in their environment or something like that, that to reveal character. Mm -hmm. I'm not very good at, you know, kind of inner monologues and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, but there's, so, I mean, I love that you write pages and pages of, I mean, to me, the more dialogue that you write, the better, because your sense of dialogue and the, the way people say things, like, I just, I laughed out loud so many times, I think I, I or have already mentioned to you in the next story that I'm going to ask you to read from. I think, I think it might be my favorite story in the book, um, although that is a, a really tough um, uh, thing for me to answer. Um, but in Beyond Carthage, um, there, uh, which is a story about two women um, friends who are on holiday, uh, when Noreen gets, <laughs> Noreen has had a few drinks, and she gets into a taxi driven by a Tunisian 
fellow and um <clears throat> she said she just gets in and says loving the motor <laughs> and i just i, I <coughs> chuckled at that just because you have an ear for the way people really talk and just something like that loving the motor is and and, and a particular way that irish people talk um that just mm -hmm. i think you have a, a perfect pitch for that louise um thank you very much so gonna, I, I think a lot of that is because it's nearly um you know that I grew up in the north um, and I lived there until I was 12 and um, I mean I don't speak anymore the way that I spoke when I was a, a child but I think that um, there's maybe a kind of inner voice or something that's still quite northern um, mm -hmm. but you know when we moved to the south it wasn't just that people's accents were different like I was prepared for that and I was prepared for you know them using different words for things but um, there's there's something about it like even the syntax um, of, of sentences um, down here is different from, from, from the mm -hmm. north or certainly where I lived in the north um, and I had to listen really hard. I just find it fascinating. But you love all that as well, Alice. Like your your background mm -hmm. is in sociolinguistics as well, so you you love that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it is. And 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 uh, yeah, I suppose that's something that um, that we share is that kind of love. Like uh, uh, you uh, on Twitter will often say uh, talk about your book, B U K E, which I, I hear yeah. you know the Dublin the Dublin pronunciation, <laughs> um, but. Um, yeah, I think so. Beyond Carthage is is the story that I'd like to go to next. And um, okay, so as I said earlier, this is Noreen and Therese who are on a holiday. Um, maybe not their first choice, but um, they they go to Tunisia where it's raining uh, for most of the time. Um, and again, I, I I was struck by something you just said earlier about your 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 feeling when a story isn't working, it's not getting at the emotional truth of something. And I think I think that's one of the things that I love about this story is like all of your stories, it pries off uh, the veneer of, of the surface of the way people like to think about themselves or want to present themselves. And you're really looking at how, what's really going on. And especially in this story, there's a lot really going on with Therese in terms of her body, her relationship to her body, which is a new relationship that she has to surrender to because of an illness that she has suffered. But it's also had um, repercussions with her relationship with Donald, her husband. And and so you're you're getting into um, into that story. And I think I think one of the things that I that I love about that story and what I love about all of the stories in this book is there's great empathy even for characters like like Liam who's uh, in in the previous story who isn't behaving very well there's still a sense that you you like your characters that you you're at least if, or if you don't like them that you are trying to understand them trying to understand why they're doing what they're doing could you talk maybe a little bit about that, about the idea of empathy towards your characters and maybe maybe the origins of the story of Beyond Carthage, how, how that came about? Um, I had um, a terrible um, holiday a week in, in Tunisia um, in the rain <laughs> uh, one March. And um, um, yeah, I may have been um, kind of inappropriately handled in a hammam that really was a bit of a knocking shop. Um, we all were one afternoon after drinking duty free Bacardi. Um, but um, so, so a lot of those details are, are authentic. Um, but, um, so um, yeah, I, I, and also, um, I mean, those resorts in Tunisia, the Tunisian government built them and, and they're terribly proud of them uh, and, and stuff as well. But um, um, they're they're just really sort of airless, lifeless, soulless, um, concretey sort of um, um, just unit after unit um, of of um, hotels and shops and things. And, um, yeah, so that that's sort of weird. And I suppose there is that sort of um, you know that terrible approach that tourists always have, where you know we, you know we're looking for you know this kind of authentic experience, um, and um, yeah, which is obnoxious, obviously, but. Um, um, yeah, and I think it was something then at, at that time off season um, that there were lots of these uh, women who, you know, I was in my twenties, we were in our twenties, but um, there were lots of women then who would have been, um, you know, a lot of leathery chests and bad highlights and um, yeah, um, <laughs> uh, sitting around with young fellas, but uh, local young fellas. And um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know, I started to write that story. I think it changed a little bit 
uh, over time. But then there's some lines that, you know, again, there's, there'll be pages that haven't changed at all. Um, I don't actually, I, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but I don't really know where I decided to um, make these, where the mastectomy came into it and stuff like that. There, there was stuff that I was reading at the time. I was reading a lot about um, Dido um, at the time. And, um, you know, the... There's some, I'm actually really bad at math, but there's some sort of a problem in maths, okay? And, and it's supposed to be explained by this um, idea that when Dido got to Carthage, she asked the, um, you know, the local ruler for a, a piece of land to found a, a city. And um, he gave her um, an ox hide and said that she could, um, that she could have that amount of, of space to found her city. So she cut it into loads and loads of strips and sewed the strips end to end and and it was able to take in the whole hillside and all the way down to the port. Um, and I think that the, maybe that was in my mind or something like that. So I don't know if that's what where that came came from, you know, with them. Um, mm. uh, but I didn't put that in the story because it just seemed in the end, it seemed to be too um, too obvious or something. Um, especially because, you know, she's standing in Carthage. If I'm then, you know, going to start dragging in things like that, it would have sounded like a Wikipedia entry or something. Um, but so, you put um, in at the end. Yeah, I did the salt. You that was all I did. I, I did the salt. I didn't because I, I thought that the salt was kind of okay because of the weather or something because the sun had come out. Um, but yeah, you know, apparently, yeah, the Romans sprinkled it with salt so that nothing would would, would grow again or whatever. So yeah, the salt thing is from this sort of dido thing as she, as she was sailing away. But um, yeah, but I I just thought that to put in, you know, that sort of uh, ma mathematical sort of problem idea or something was going to be too much. Um, so I think maybe after that, that was where I, I got this idea of the kind of um you know the mastectomy boob i guess you know with this sort of torn flesh or something as well but yeah it, i think it would have been too much to, to put in a bit about the height um, will you um, read a little bit read? from from yeah. beyond carthage yeah okay so um yeah some of it's a bit rude so i read the bit when i read where they yeah, get into where where he picks them up okay <clears throat> so this is where, um, so the women have been there for a few days and they're really bored and uh, they've hit the duty free and um, there's nothing to do. And um, they have booked um, a couple of uh, kind of spa treatments in this place um, that, that um, looks very traditional and stuff from the, um, in the brochure. And um, they've just been, they're, they've just been collected from the, from the hotel. Um, reception called to say their car had arrived. They weren't ready. Therese didn't have time to brush her teeth and mouth, uh, sorry, her teeth and her mouth was waxy from eating nuts. On the way down, Noreen answered everything Therese said with a loose laugh. When the lift doors opened, the few people who were sitting around the foyer were looking in their direction, Noreen's guffaws clearly audible from a couple of floors away. A tall, slim man in jeans and a suit jacket was waiting by the desk. He said his name was Giuseppe. He brought them outside to his car, a model of Fiat Therese had never seen before. Noreen sat in the front beside him. Loving the motor, she said. Giuseppe put a plastic card in a slot and the dashboard lit up. Buongiorno, said a deep electronic male voice. Buongiorno yourself, said Noreen and slapped her thigh. Her movements had become expansive and inaccurate and she knocked her elbow against the back of Giuseppe's hand. The gold Rolex watch on his wrist was loose and made a tinny jangle. Are you French, Giuseppe? Italiano. Very nice, said Noreen. Therese bit the inside of her cheeks to keep her laughing. Noreen looked at her in the rearview mirror and stuck her tongue out. Giuseppe braked hard when he needed to slow and took quarters in third gear. When they got out, Therese put her hands on the roof of the car to steady herself. The flyer had shown a traditional bathhouse. They were outside the annex to an office, office block, a flat roofed concrete building with a row of high windows. Inside, they were greeted by a young woman wearing a white tunic and trousers like a nurse's uniform. She was heavily made up, her hair covered by a scarf. She led them into a changing room, gave them baskets for their belongings. She handed each of them a towel and a piece of turquoise tissue paper. Noreen unfolded hers. It was a pair of disposable knickers. She held them up in front of Therese's face and tugged the elastic on the waistband in and out. I hear, said Therese. They undressed with care, 
folding each garment as it was removed, placing it in the basket. The paper rustled beneath their towels as they wriggled into the surgical pants. Just as they were ready, Giuseppe came into the room. Therese looked around the walls and ceiling. He'd come in so promptly, she wondered had he been watching them on a monitor. She and Noreen stood side by side, their feet in white cotton slippers. Giuseppe stepped forward and tugged their towels away. It reminded Therese of a trick she'd seen on TV when she was a child involving a tablecloth and stacks of clattery china. Giuseppe looked at Therese's body for a second longer than was polite. His removal of the towel was so flamboyant he'd lose face by giving it back to her. Noreen crossed her arms over her breasts. They squashed out above and below, blue veined and creamy like Stilton. I've already, I've thank, already you, thank you, Louise. Thank you, Louise. I've I, already, I've uh, already described to a friend the way that you've described that woman's breasts as creamy and blue veined like Stilton. It's just perfect description. Thank you. Thank you. Love that. Love that story. Um, let me just look at the time here. Okay, well, we're we're coming up to halfway through this event, so. Um, Soon we, we want to um, open it up to, to some questions from people who are here. I think there's a lot of people here. Um, they are all abstract and in the virtual world, but there's a lot of people here, Louise, who want to help you. That might be because I engaged in some uh, emotional blackmail on Twitter earlier and told them I'd go friends <laughs> and they'd feel that it would be really nice if they all turned up. I'd say that's probably why. <laughs> I think many of them were signed up even before the emotional blackmail took place. Uh, <laughs> um, and and I, I have to say that um, I, I really I really wish we were all together in a room and we all had loads of bottles of champagne that we could uh, we could pop the corks on because I know that there's there's a groundswell of um, support for you and and enthusiasm for for you as a person but for this book in particular, Louise, because it really is a special thing that you're launching into the world. Thank you very um, and, much. And followed by, we, with anticipation, a novel that we know you are hard at work on. Um, and so I haven't done much on it then for a few for weeks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have other things to do. There hasn't been a lot done. Jesus, yeah. <laughs> So I was going to ask you to, if you'd read something from Gibraltar, but I'm 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 thinking that it maybe it, it it might be better to to go to the audience because we we do have so many people here. What what do you think yourself? Um, I don't mind. Yeah, actually, go to the audience. You're sick of me listening to me reading. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we could. <clears throat> well, I actually I'm not sick of listening. Alice, to thank you. Me. Really, thanks so much. Absolute pleasure, really an absolute pleasure. Um, so Lou McGrath, should we, do you have some questions you want to, um, yeah, okay. I, I imagine that they're piling up there. We do, we have um, we have a really lovely, warm um, response coming through the chat here. Um, and it's really nice to see so many Sligo writers as well, that the community are here to support you, Louise, so that's lovely. Um, a few of the comments from Julia Kelly, she says, love this, wonderful black humour and stunning sparse description. Um, from Covery, there says, Louise is the best short story writer in Ireland today. Such a difficult craft, she's just an absolute master at it. Mm -hmm. And um, Another comment there, the joy in mucking around with language. Love that. Congrats, Louise, on such an accomplished collection of stories. You're an inspiration. And that's from Caroline. Um, one of the first questions to come in is an interesting one um, from Paula Galvin. Who is your all time favorite short story writer? Not Irish. Not Irish. Mm. Not Irish. Um, that's really hard because it kind of changes every week. Um, I <laughs> I know this to be true <laughs> from yeah. working with you in the library. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I, I think Alice Monroe's a genius, um, but I think the stories that have given me consistently so much pleasure over the years are by um, a woman called Ellen Gilchrist, um, who is from, she's from uh, New, New Orleans, I think, but um, she lectured in um, the university um, 
uh, of Arkansas at Fayetteville, which is partly, I, I was, she's still there apparently in some honorary position. So I was kind of running around looking for her, but she's not there. She's a very old lady now. Um, but yeah, I just completely love her stories. Um, they're they're uh, really hilarious and devastating and um, and kind of savage as well. Um, and um, yeah, she is just That's uh, like, powers. <laughs> Sorry, I cut it, Grazi. I was just going to say that sounds quite familiar. That that sounds like it could be an appraisal of your writing as well. I know it's. <laughs> um, another comment here from uh, Deirdre Mahan. She says, "I went to UCD with Louise back in the eighties, and she was a great storyteller back then. Albeit in the student union hangout while smoking fags and throwing down coffee. Well done on this book. Can't wait to get stuck in." That's <laughs> Grazi. Yeah, hello, Deirdre. <laughs> <laughs> and then oh, Anne O'Brien <laughs> Anne O'Brien uh, wants to ask you uh, Hi Louise, how did you go about deciding the sequence for the stories in the collection? Is there an overall arc? Uh, okay, so um, I had a, a tiny bit of help, uh, a wee bit of help uh, on that, a bit of advice. Um, I spoke to Declan Mead about it from the Stay and Fly and um, he he said that there um, he said that I should um, uh, try and blow people's minds with the first few stories, stick anything that was a bit mad um, or experimental in the middle, and then try and finish on a kind of positive note. Um, now I don't know if Garland Sunday is a positive note because um, there are like quite terrible things that happen in it, um, but um, yeah, it ends with a bit of sex, which maybe is positive. So I don't know, but apart from that, it's probably pretty, um, pretty full on. Yeah. So that was kind of, kind of the idea. Um, yeah, I, I kind of expected when, you know, they were arranged in that order and I expected that when Bloomsbury were going to publish that, um, that they might like to rearrange things, but that didn't happen. I mean, the, the book is pretty much, um, um, you know, it, it did have a, a, a copy edits, but it, it pretty much unchanged from the, the manuscripts. I think that I submitted in the first place. Mm. Louise, could you uh, just talk about the title, where that comes from? <laughs> okay, I hope my sister's watching. So um, when uh, my sister was, I mean, she was young, maybe five or six, um, she asked us if the end of the world was a cul-de-sac, um, which we teased her about terribly. Um, <gasps> yeah, and so when she was kind of very wow. spacey, six-year-old or something, yeah. Um, <laughs> so that's where it came yeah. from. Such a great title. It's great. Yeah. It's memorable. It's memorable yeah. and it's um uh it just has so many resonances. You know. It's yeah. A great title. Yeah, it's kind of funny for now as well because uh, I live in a cul-de-sac that I've hardly left in about a year so yeah. that's kind of nasty. Yeah. <laughs> just being like the end of the world. <laughs> yeah, negative equity, negative equity in a cul-de-sac that I haven't left for a year great practice. Yeah. <laughs> That's a slightly longer time she has, not quite as snappy. <laughs> yeah, as long enough as it is. Um, I have a question here I'm intrigued by from Martin and Evelyn Keneally. Um, they ask about in silhouette. Is Sean's yeah. wife more than wife? Is Sean's wife what? More than more a than wife. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I know what that means. Um, Sean's wife doesn't make an appearance, so um, I mean, I suppose uh, the character in, in Silhouette isn't named, and um, she um, has a, a boyfriend um, who's like married <laughs> with children, and um, so Sean's wife is referred to a couple of times. But um, yeah, I don't think she's more than a wife. I think she's just a wife whose um, husband's a dirtbird. I don't know. If there's much. I don't know. <laughs> Okay, well, I hope that answers it um, for Martin and Evelyn. If you want to pop another comment into the box, uh, maybe to clarify, uh, yeah. I can read it out to Louise. Yeah, I, I wasn't sure myself when I read it. Um, now, let's see, we have some more comments. Um, massive congratulations, Louise, from Amanda Geard. Um, over oh, the moon for you, Louise. Thank you. Larry Maxwell. Kat Hogan says, so very delighted for you, Louise. Ah, uh, Cash um, Hogan is amazing. Thank you, Cash. <laughs> um, let's see. There's somebody from the Netherlands. Uh, Chris Cusack loves the fact that he can now attend all these literary events in Ireland. It is oh, one that's of great. Small uh, uh, Chris Cusack helped me with my PhD actually from the Netherlands on Twitter. He's great. Hello, Chris. Fantastic. 
Um, there was a question I wanted to ask actually as well about, yeah, Brona um, Makatasny. Sorry, Brona, Brona Makatasny. Yeah. There you go. Thank Brona you. Brona um, in my um, class in P1. Um, so I've known Brona Makatasny since January 1972. She's the person I probably wow. know the longest who's related to me, yeah. Oh, that's gorgeous. Well, she is wondering how much influence has your Northern Ireland childhood had on your use of language? I'm thinking especially of the dark humour you use. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it probably, yeah, I think I think um, with a, like, I, I do think my internal voice is, is Northern. So I do think that I, I think with a, a kind of a Northern, I think I probably have a Northern sensibility if there's such a thing, but I think I, I probably do. Yeah, and I remember you telling me before about um, having moved around a little bit and having to code switch a little bit and, and use slightly different uh, language maybe then in Dublin. And that came through for me in the stories as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's probably that. I just have a, yeah, I kind of have a, I, I take in things a lot kind of by ear or something. I have a kind of ear for dialogue or the way people speak, I think, really. Yeah. Yeah, and you're you're a wicked mimic as well. <laughs> I think that's yeah. I think that's partly why I lost my accent um, as well very easily. Um, yeah. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. That, that's that's what it's Yeah. Yeah. Could I interject here in the library when we shouldn't? Alice, go on ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Just with a question, with Louise, you were talking about uh, well, when at the mention of Chris Cusack in the Netherlands and your PhD. I um I wanted to know if you would tell us a little bit more. Well, it kind of it's kind of two questions. One is um, I know that you did your research on Nora Holt. Um, yeah. And maybe if you could talk a little bit about her, maybe for the the people that are here um, who might not be aware of her, and yeah. where we might be able to read something by her. And then if there are any other Irish writers that you would like to call people's attention to um, that, you know, have been important to you or people that you've read recently that have, you know, made an impression on you? Yeah. Uh, okay. So the critical part of my PhD was on um, an Irish writer called Nora Holt, who was born in Dublin in 1898. Um, and when she was about nine, her both her parents died within about seven or eight months of each other. And she was sent to live with her English father's family in um, in England. And um, she had one brother who, um, uh, you know, as a teenager enlisted in the British Army and um, he was, I think he was sent to the front and then injured and patched up something like three times and he survived the war only to commit suicide, um, uh, I think on New Year's Day, um, 1919. Um, so she really was uh, quite alone in the world and she wrote uh, 28 books. Um, they're all really about, I mean, her thing was unsheltered women because she was an unsheltered woman. Um, and her thing was about how difficult um, it is uh, for women to remain re respectable um, when they don't have any money. Um, um, so yeah, I think, uh, you know, she wrote 28 books. They're not all masterpieces, but there are about three books in there that are just amazing um, and, a, and a few particular stories. So um, if you want to read Nora Holt, there is um, a Persephone Books in London reissued uh, a book called There Are No Windows. And it's about uh, a woman um, losing her mind, um, really, or, you know, uh, sort of sliding into to dementia uh, during the Blitz in London. Um, another book is Sinead Gleeson and New Island Books uh, managed to uh, get um, Cocktail Bar, her third uh, selection, uh, her collection of, uh, of short stories reissued a couple of years ago. There's an another novel that I wrote an introduction to called Farewell Happy Fields. That's all, uh, uh, it's also published by New Island. And then in, um, in Sinead Gleeson's uh, anthology, you know, the 100 Irish short stories, The Art of the Glimpse, there is arguably, I think, probably the best sort of uh, mid-century Irish uh, short story of all, uh, by, and it's by Nora Holt, and it's called Nine Years is a Long Time. It's just a brilliant short story. So that's Nora Holt. Um, uh, I think the book that I have read in the last uh, year, the last while, so I don't know, I, like I'm reading so much, but I'd say in the last couple of months, the book that has um, absolutely blown my mind is by Conor O'Callaghan, and it's called, um, oh God, I keep getting the titles mixed up. What's the title of it? We are, 
We are not in the world. We're not in the world, isn't that it? We're not in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely yeah. uh, blew my mind. A uh, wonderful book. Okay. <clears throat> and then, um, in case you missed this, uh, Anne Devlin wrote a collection of short stories in the 80s that was published by Faber that's called uh, The Way Paper. And I think that collection was that was really important to me, you know, as a reader in the 80s and 90s. And it probably um, influenced, I think her writing probably has influenced me more than anybody's actually. Uh -huh. well, the Way Paver? The Way Paver, and it's by oh, Anne Devlin. You. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Elise. Wonderful. Maybe um, as we as we move towards a wrap up, that might be a nice thing <clears throat> if you would read something um, from the, the, one of the stories um, towards the end of the book, Gibraltar, um, okay. which is set in Sligo Town. And um, uh, I, I just think it's a wonderful conceit that when I when, when I've thought about this conceit of writing a story based on a series of photographs, I've always wondered how one could get beyond the gimmick of it, and you you do completely. It, 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 in effect, you get completely hooked into the story, and and the photographs and the the procession of them kind of fall away. It's really beautiful. Oh, I'm, it, it's actually so good to hear that because that, that story gave me awful trouble. Um, and it's probably the only mm -hmm. story in, mm -hmm. in the book that's like conceptual in origin. So um, I had uh, reread, because I'd read it at some point in the 90s, um, uh, Richard Kapuscinski's book, Shah of Shahs. You know, he um, he, he, mm -hmm. he was in Tehran um, when the Islamic revolution was unfolding. And in one chapter quite near to the beginning, I think it's called something like Daguerreotypes, um, he tries to tell the story of the Pahlavi uh, regime, you know, that that was um, ousted mm -hmm. by by the um, by the Islamic Revolution, um, through a series of photographs. But I, maybe there, are, I actually can, I don't have the copy here, and I I feel I mean he he did it so well that I feel as if I've seen these photographs, but I think the photographs aren't there. I think all you have is is what he describes. And I think as well as that, from my point of view, it was a way of using an omniscient narrator. Um, which is quite an old, you know, people don't really do that anymore. And I just thought that um, it would be a way of, I mean, what I tried to do, it, it was really difficult, but I tried to like apply some discipline to it. So describe what's in the frame of the photograph and then just gradually zoom out and out and out and out. And then to try and have the odd, um, you know, kind of thought from, from each of the people in the photograph. Um, um, and it was really hard. And I don't know if I did apply the discipline um, really strictly. Um, and also, I wanted it to look as if, um, you know, that there was a, like a clutch of family photographs that somebody had like taken out of a biscuit tin in no particular order or just, you know, um, picked up from a, 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 you know, a scatter on a table or something. And um, so it, it had to look random, but also it, it had to follow some kind of a narrative arc. And that was really hard, you know, because they're, they're all over the place. But the only thing I knew was that um, I wrote the very first um photograph first the first time that this couple meet or I mean they don't even meet they're just in, in this in a photograph at, at this place Gibraltar and Sligo at the same time in the 70s and um, so I knew that was going to be the last image but that's kind of all all I knew um anyway I should stop talking about it and just read a bit so I might will I read um because some of that's very rude actually so will I just read the um the last it's the last bit <laughs> okay. okay sure I won't read any of the dirty bits sorry I think my mother and father might be there. Did you know this? Um, <laughs> my mother's already probably not speaking to me because I showed a picture of her in her pajamas with wet clothes <laughs> on the floor. Um, okay, so this is. Uh, uh, hold on, actually, maybe I'll do the first one. Will I? Yeah, I could do the first one. Um, uh, 1983. Audrey McGuigan is in front of the wire fence that marks the end of their garden, where newly planted lawn gives way to tufts of rose root and marum grass. Behind her, Ben Bulban is under cloud, only the west side visible, curving into the sea. The tide is out, an acrid slime covering the seabed. A dog has left the carcass of a sewage fattened mullet in the low dunes, and the smell repulses her. She's seven months pregnant. Marty hasn't figured out how to use his new camera, and Audrey has been standing stock still for five minutes. He's just noticed how huge she is, at least as big as when she was full term with Rory, who is out of the picture, climbing over the Gibraltar rocks to get away from his parents bickering. 
After a clutch of car sales, Marty goes to auctions. He's bought a scrap of waste ground, a terraced house on Harmony Hill, a derelict shop near the docks. He also bought the field that borders, borders Gibraltar. Half an hour ago, he put a sign on one of the gates that reads, keep off these lands. Where is he going with his lands? Audrey wanted to know, and him reared in Baluba Bloody Terrace. Their Queen Anne style house is a bespoke pine kitchen away from finished. Rockview Lodge, they'll call it. There'll be a row about that too. Pine kitchen away from finished. It's <laughs> great. Thank you so much, Louise. Thank you. Lou, Lou, are there um, other things from the side chat that we need to? There, there are, I think, Hi, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, there's a lovely question here, actually, from Una Manion, who I'll probably mention again before we uh, we finish. Louise, this is a brilliant and important book. So, so happy for you. Can you say something about the pagan mystic, uh, or sorry, pagan mythic spaces in the stories and what you do with them? Wishing trees, fairy forts, and your sort of black pastoral treatment. Oh my God, I, uh, so Una agreed to be my best friend uh, last week as well. So hello, best friend. <laughs> I had to ask for permission to call her my best friend in the Irish news. Um, uh, yeah, and actually Black Pastoral is tremendous. I'm so happy with that. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I think um, I think there's maybe something. I, there's, when I was a child, um, my mother gave me um, Sinead de Valera's um, uh, Irish fairy tales to read. And I think because of that, I sort of have a thing about um, mythology uh, and some of those stories and um, uh, there's maybe something about um, because I'm always an outsider like wherever I go and uh, living in Sligo you know if I took my kids for walks and stuff uh, children are always very curious um, and I guess I'm kind of curious as well so I'd have to come home and look things up and um, and I think because of that I ended up um, you know I want, you know, that I, I get obsessed with a particular place for a while. So I went through um, about two months of being completely obsessed with the caves um, at the cage. Um, and I ended up reading, um, you know, kind of um, archaeology papers. And um, um, I ended up reading a book about infanticide. I read, um, I don't know what, I was kind of trying to get uh, excerpts from the Book of Ballymote uh, online and stuff like that. Um, so I think all of that for me is very much about place and maybe it's just a way of looking at place at, at every level because I, I've talked to Una about this before that um, when I um, did my PhD, Viva, um, uh, Nick, Nick Laird, who was the intern examiner, said that um, that um, that, there, that, that the, the stories were, that I'd um, applied there was an element of din, din shanikas in it you know there's it's this very old irish word um that means uh lore of of place you know about the, sto the stories that are attached to place and um i don't think i did that deliberately um at all but um i suppose um uh, like and, and then when um i was talking to una about it and she she'd been reading a lot about it and she she thinks it's a form of deep mapping and i think that's um that's that's probably true so yeah i mean i don't know does that answer the question does it what was that last word there, Louise? It's a form of deep, uh, deep, deep mapping. Yeah, so okay. it's a way of looking at. So you know, if you think of a, you know, a, a conventional map is like flat and one dimensional, and um, but uh, with with deep mapping, um, you're looking at um, kind of associations, history, memory, um, and folklore, and all of that. So it's just a way of kind of looking at a place in a, in a very kind of deep, uh, you know, a very layered uh, way. And I think. Um, yeah, those are really, um, uh, it's like a really brilliant tool for writing fiction. Mm, mm. So I think and the story think in the collection that probably uses that the most is, is the final one. Um, uh, what is the final one? Garland Sunday. So the, there's a Garland lot of that Sunday, going on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I think also yeah. um, <clears throat> when you uh, have moved around a lot and when you, as you say, you're an outsider wherever you go, I think there is, there can be anyway, a, a real attachment to or interest in really going deep in and uh, yeah and investigating yeah because i know you have that as well alice I think you've had that yeah that you totally have that too yeah um mm. yeah i mean it, i don't know it's sort of weird i think that as i've got older because my children feel that they're very like 
my children are like Sligo people because they were born here and they, they've <laughs> always lived here. And I, I've never had that. Um, and I think as I get older, I'm kind of a bit envious or something. Um, but maybe it's mm -hmm. it's good to be an outsider, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think that the Sligo landscape will always um, speak through its artists and its writers as well. I've often observed that the land wants to share. So that doesn't mm. surprise me. It's beautiful. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. And I think it's just because there are so many marks um, on the landscape here, you know, the kind of built environment uh, that was built like thousands of years ago. It's very hard um, to, you know, to overlook the fact that um, humans have been moving over this landscape for thousands of years and um, probably screwing up the way that we, we do as well. Um, and certainly all of the lore and the mythology uh, kind of reflects that, you know? Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yeah. There is so, one last question, but Alice, were you, sorry, what were you gonna say? Well, I was just gonna say, be, just because we were on the subject of Unamanian that I didn't want to let go of the, um, the thought that next month Unamanian is going to be um, uh, in the spotlight, um, also through Sligo Libraries, um, with the word um, at the the last Wednesday in April. Um, Lou, maybe you have the date. I don't have it to hand, but Una will be reading from her book just out, um, A Crooked Tree, published by Faber and Faber, and she will be interviewed by David North and Lauren Baker, two second year students at um, the Writing and Literature course in IT Sligo. And there'll be a musical guest as well. Um, so that's something to look forward to. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that for mm -hmm. Una. Yeah, and um, if anybody wants to keep up to date with that, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we'll have all the information on that up shortly. So, sorry, I just one last question. Louise, sorry, go on ahead. My phone is pinging as if I'm a drug dealer. Sorry about that. Um, I need to. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> well, much like the chat here, actually, I've taken screenshots um, and I'll, I'll do another few just before we, we go, just so that you get to see it, because I know you're you're not necessarily on Zoom at the same time, but the flood of love and support um, that's coming in for you is just wild, Louise. I'm like, really right. time to enjoy it, because it's, it's incredible. But one of the questions, um, and they're flying in last night, but it's moving away from me. Um, <laughs> one of the questions that, the, the spirit of the question anyway was about when you started writing and how you found your voice and I just uh, hoped you might leave us with a couple of lines on that because I'm always aware that people are inspired by stories like this and I know your story is very inspiring so if you could just tell us a little bit about that about your journey to actually starting writing to this being published in this moment. Um, well I, I feel like I've said this about 50 times in the last um a few weeks, but um, yeah, I, I, I came to writing by accident. Um, my friend, Neil McCabe, um, who is um, a, 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 like a great writer, a totally awards uh, winning writer, had been, in, but she hadn't really written anything then either, um, had been invited to join a writing group that Una Mannion and Rose Jordan were setting up. And I, um, she asked me to go, and I think I laughed, and, um, um, and she asked me a couple more times and I eventually agreed. And um, so, yeah, I went along. And um, yeah, so anyway, I um, wrote a short story, which was, I. Um, it's kind of funny because I think it was like really florid and um, uh, and um, I, I think that at the time, I think that when I started off, uh, the, the, the kind of writing voice was very different from my own voice, but I think that maybe just with practice, you know, so I, I, I don't know what you mean. There's a, you know, there's a term for voice, which is, um, uh, it, it's not about me learning to express myself. That's not what I'm talking about. It's about, um, it's about, um, the, the voice on the page or something like that. Um, and I think that just came with, um, maybe pairing back my writing quite a bit. Um, and short stories are great training for that because you don't get away with a spare word. Uh, never mind a, a sentence. You don't get away with anything at all. I think that was really helpful for it, and um, um, and just with practice, like, um, 
I mean, from when I started, I, I guess it was almost like a kind of mania. Like I would have been out in the shed at five in the morning and um, staying out there late at night. Um, I um, I used to bring my laptop into work in, in the library and, and write through lunch in that little room with the sticky carpet yeah. on top of the carpet. Sorry, it was lovely now. Um, uh, and um, do you know what I mean? So, uh, and, and actually, even when I started writing, um, we we still had a restaurant that was going down the tube uh, that didn't have any that didn't really have a lot of customers. So I used to write in. I didn't have a computer, so I was writing in this um, notebook that I used to write menus and kitchen prep lists in. Um, and I was doing that in the um, during the very lengthy and frequent lulls in service because obviously the restaurant wasn't doing very well. So yeah, I mean, I, I just kind of went at it. Um, um, in, in any of the snatches of time, and yeah, I, I mean, there are things that people, you know, you could be looking at articles or reading books about writing, and um, but the only way you're going to learn is just to get your arse in the chair and do it, and um, and read loads, just read loads, um, yeah, that's that's all I do. Yep. yep. Thank you so much, Louise. Of course. Alice, would you like to Alice, say anything? I, I just want to say congratulations, Louise. And um, I've really, I've really enjoyed this evening and um, just chatting with you. And I just feel like it's a chat that could go on forever. Um, I, yeah, I'm just thrilled for you, thrilled for this book. So excited uh, for all the people here in this virtual room who have read it and want to celebrate it at, or who, um, are in the enviable position of not having read it yet and get to it to experience it so just alice thank you so you. much honestly gosh thank you very much really absolute pleasure thanks and <laughs> thanks louise and everybody in your library i'm sorry um i didn't really mean it about the carpet i was just playing for dramatic <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear me howling laughing in the background. I can neither confirm nor deny the stickiness of the carpet. <laughs> well, on that lovely note, um, folks, so much thank you. Lovely, lovely audience, amazing audience. I'm going to scramble now and try and get the rest of your comments to pass on to Louise. And um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us tonight. And we look forward to welcoming you again at the end of the month, the 28th at half six. Um, we'll be here with Una Mannion. So we look forward to seeing you then. And once again, huge congratulations to Louise and good night.